Hey everyone, I'm here at Coral Morphologic in Miami, Florida, and we're going to go inside and see what Colin Ford is working on. Hey, welcome, Jay. Hey, Colin. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Welcome to Coral Morphologic. Awesome. So tell me about this place. Yeah, so this is, uh, we've been here for a decade now, um, and this is a, a little historic neighborhood in Miami called Spring Garden. Um, this house was actually built in 1938, which is actually a really old house for Miami. Welcome to the Coral City. That's, <laughs> that's what we call Miami. You know, this was, Miami was the city that was built by coral. Our buildings are made from coral fossils, the cement, and then in the future with sea level rise, um, you know, it's a city that has a, a date with underwater destiny. Awesome. Well, yeah. speaking of underwater destiny, I can't wait to uh, check out yeah, your Yeah, come, come on inside. All right. One of the things that I think is really interesting is coral morphologic and, uh, and what you do. Sure. How you make money, how you got here, right. the transition from raising and growing corals into sure. videography, and uh, what can you tell me about that? Well, it, uh, it, it, it's a bit of a long story, I guess, right? I was, uh, I was growing corals in high school you know, wow. in the late 90s. Um, and. I got a scholarship to study marine biology at the University of Miami, um, and I sort of naively thought that when I got here that I was going to meet other students that had similar interests, and to my surprise that there really were not any students that were interested in growing corals and aquariums. In the marine biology in program. In the marine biology program, yeah, you know, everyone wanted to be a dolphin trainer or swim with sharks or something. Um, and so I ended up sort of becoming a lot more... Um, friends and, and got a lot more inspiration from my art and music school um, buddies that were doing stuff in Wynwood, which is at the time was just sort of beginning to become this artistic neighborhood that it has developed into. And um, you know, I realized one day going to an art show that the stuff I was seeing on the walls, it's like, wait a minute, these corals that I that I love so much and that I study are every bit as beautiful and every bit, you know, living art forms as, you know, anything else that you could put in a gallery. And so, you know, and also realizing that, you know, with, with the coral reefs dying um, and, and die-offs around the world, a lot of big bleaching events taking place, that communication is really important. To, and a lot of people still don't understand what corals are. Um, and so, you know, I think that... <laughs> Including me, to a certain extent, <laughs> well, I'll be I mean, honest. I They're think pretty I, complicated. I, all of us uh, still, you know, they're, they're sort of very mysterious organisms, which is why it's so exciting to work with them, because, they're, you know, there's still, still so many mysteries. Um, so, you know, because people don't really fully understand what a coral is when we talk about the coral reefs dying, um, you know, to be able to, to showcase their aesthetic beauty to people um, is, I think, a really good way to kind of captivate them, to bring them in. So, of course, you know, reef aquarists understand this very well. The advent of LED lighting has been really um, instrumental in, in sort of bringing people into the, the beauty of the corals. Um, so, you know, here in Miami to sort of take that to its next logical step, which is, you know, let's make corals a part of the, the pop cultural identity of the city, which, you know, people, I think, think of Miami as kind of this, um, this artificial neon kind of place, a plastic place. You know, it doesn't really get a lot of credit as being a, um, a place of natural beauty and wonder, but um, the reality is that corals were the original neon citizens of Miami, and they literally built the city that is, you know, has been built upon old coral reef. Um, and then, of course, in the future, having to think about things like sea level rise and recognizing, you know, the, the coastline of Florida is constantly shifting. Um, and then in the future, the city can go underwater, but the corals, the corals will come back and grow over the, 
grow over the city. Well, you're certainly making your name for a name for yourself with respect to uh, um, National Geographic and the Discovery Channel and 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 uh, your work in terms of the videography well, and bringing you. that to the uh, the forefront of, of of the public and then. Um, through the more, I guess, grassroots of the working with the local schools. Mm -hmm. I, I know you do a lot of that work, mm -hmm. um, as well as obviously your, your voice and the hobby and the industry. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I can't say enough about that, and I think that's really cool. Um, I have to say, though, at this point, I really want to go look at your, your tanks. Yep. Let's go, let's go take a look at all these different, <laughs> different displays and biotopes I got. Awesome. The private collection of Colin Ford of Morphologic. Coral Morphologic this is, here. This is the Coral Morphologic collection. <laughs> and it is quite, you have some really beautiful stuff. In Thank here. you. Thank you. Now, some of these corals have been growing for uh, eight or nine years. Um, some of them been sort of aquaculture, some of them. Of course, the zoanthids we grow um, has sort of been a source of currency as we get the more exotic uh, corals, especially the LPS corals. Um, and uh, those, you know, like the LPS corals, the larger corals, of course, I'm, I'm using in Coral Morphologics film projects. Um, so we're actually, we've, we did filming last year um, for the National Geographic show One Strange Rock, which is airing right now. Um, episode eight, Aliens, is gonna be the one that features most of the, uh, the coral and marine life that we filmed. Um, Any movie stars on this particular tank? Yeah, the the fungi the fungia is definitely a um, a very uh, this guy right here. Yep, the He's green a, green with with orange mouth fungia yeah. is definitely um, one of the famous ones. Um, I think it was featured during an advertisement in the Super Bowl for the show. No the way, movie. really. Mm -hmm. Wow. And um, yeah, I didn't know that until afterwards when I learned that they had uh, that they'd advertised the show during the Super Bowl. But uh, yeah, and the, and the opening the opening shot to that show is a man of war that we filmed here, right here in this in this very room. So every every single episode starts uh, right here, basically. We're going to be working on a, a full length feature film this year uh, with this band called uh, Animal Collective, and it's a sort of like a visual album called Tangerine Reef. So it's gonna be an hour of kind of really psychedelic music and choral footage um, that you'll just be able to kind of like put on and zone out to. And um, you know, our goal through Coral Morphologic is to introduce people who aren't reef aquarists and who aren't necessarily divers or scientists, um, you know, as to the beauty of corals to try and you know mesmerize and, and captivate them. So, you know, we see you know using popular culture and fashion is a really great way to introduce people outside of um, you know these um, already existing groups of people that, that know and love corals to bring to bring them in. Um, and then you know I think that that can only be good for um, coral reef awareness. And then of course I, I feel that the more the more people that are actively growing corals, um, I feel like that can only be good for the status of, of corals and coral reefs around the world. The more, the more that we have people engaged actively, um, I feel like it, it'll be it's the best we can do to, to keep people um, you know, working to um, prevent the loss of coral biodiversity. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, speaking of coral biodiversity, I think I spotted some uh, some flower anemones over in that tank. Over yeah, there. well, we've got we've got we have probably have one of the uh, pretty pretty wildest collections of rock flower anemones, and and this is our broodstock. So we've been we're actually oh you're actually breeding them here. So this is going to be yep. Uh, do you have we do have uh, next right, generation? Well. All right, let's, let's, stand uh, let's up. go take a look at that. <laughs> okay. Wow, this is awesome. It's a pretty, pretty wild collection of, you know, it's like every color of the rainbow. And it's, it's pretty wild when you think about this is just one species. And yet, you know, color morphs, it's almost like there's an, an infinite combination of fluorescent color that this species of sea anemone um, expresses. 
And I mean, in terms of keeping them, I mean, this, this, I mean, it seems like there's a lot of algae in here, but this mm -hmm. is actually what they, I mean, naturally they live mm -hmm. in, in very shallow water with. Yeah. Rubble. Typically uh, you'll find, you'll find this species of flower anemone living in rubble and seagrass and, and shallow water. Um, but you can also find them on the reefs in deeper water, but still they live, they, they like to um, live in the rubble. So we basically, for this tub, I have um, about two or three inches of uh, Two Little Fishies Reborn uh, reactor media, which, you know, is really, allows the, um, the sea anemones to, to get their foot in and they can kind of protect their foot real um, nicely with, with um, little pieces of rubble. Um, but, you know, since I kind of keep the, a lot of the other fish out, um, you know, we sort of have, we have a bit of, bit of an algae, some algae here, but this used to also be my refugium too. So um, recently, what about maybe a month ago, I introduced some uh, tuxedo urchins. So you can see these guys, they're, they're kind of around here. They cover themselves in the algae that they eat. Um, and every day, you know, I, I pull out the pull out the screen, which collects with all of the pieces of algae that the uh, that the urchins kind of release, and then I just sort of throw it throw it out. Colors are here, are unbelievable. I mean, we got some orange, some mm -hmm. white. I mean, that one over there, it's like red, green, white, <laughs> yeah, orange, purple in the middle. And they're spawning in here, and you have offspring in here too. Yeah. Right? So what's interesting with the with the rock flower anemones is that there's actually males and females. Um, and when one male begins to release sperm, sort of like a chain reaction, um, and then what happens is the females um, absorb the sperm and then they are fertilized, their eggs are fertilized internally. So they, they brood the eggs and then they end up giving birth to tiny little baby um, sea anemones that are pretty much, you know, have already have, uh, have already gone through a, a metamorphosis so they're they're pretty much so, like, so you could do it exactly go. the same thing and you know in, in your tank at home or in mm -hmm. your you know in a yeah frag system mm -hmm. yeah this is a really a, a pretty I've, i know a number of people that have had um their bread, flower bread and spawn and, and and also give birth to to little babies and they like the light too they obviously because they they're in shallow the water so they you run very are these on a hundred percent or mm -hmm. yeah yep. wow so you're running i mean this has got to be Probably five, six hundred par at least, mm -hmm. right under, right where the, at the at the actual anemones. Mm -hmm. Of course, what you know, the anemones, the, the sort of the beauty of, of a sea anemone, since it has a foot, you know, it can, if it's getting too much light, it can always kind of close up. It can always pull itself down deeper, um, you know, into the into the rubble. So um, it's pretty difficult to to, to, over to them. over to overpower them. Um, as long as they have an opportunity to kind of like pull close, in, close, close up. up. Mm -hmm. Wow, cool. Yeah. And um, and that leaves us well with two more, but yeah, we got to go to the SPS tank. Let's go have a look at the SPS tank. On this uh, system, we've got um, four MP40s, um, and then um, of course we've got the six radions. Um, but I had to be very when we started to use um, switched over to the radions. Um, the acclimate mode was a really uh, important um, step because I've found, especially with LEDs, I mean, corals are, are very, uh, they can be very sensitive to changes in light intensity, especially if you're increasing lighting. So, you know, it's oftentimes, especially for people that are all excited, maybe they've been using some crappy, um, you know, second rate um, LEDs that aren't putting out very much par. And then they go ahead and, and you know get a nice new system, but you know you don't want to crank crank out all the light right right to begin with. So, I was uh, using the the acclimate mode um, for six weeks, um, and um, you know I've it's, everything for the most part has acclimated really well. You know there's some some corals paled out a little bit, but are coming back uh, nicely. I didn't have any otherwise didn't have any problems, but. Um, you know, it's definitely definitely something to con to consider. You know, about making sure that you're not uh, going to overly power your your corals. And then there's a lot of corals like the chalice corals, um, you know, which really come from very low light places. And so, you know, sometimes as reefers we forget since we we want to put all the corals in the same tank that you know these corals are all coming from very different places, not only ge geographically but 
you know, within the reef itself, you know, some of these corals are coming from very deep, turbid water where they might not get any direct sunlight. And then, you know, we've got other um, acros and montes that, um, you know, are coming from the reef crest and, and, and need all the light they can get. So. I have I have one big question. Mm -hmm. um, I'm loving I'm loving these. Did you mm -hmm. find them that way, or did you grow? Them? This is a, this has been a grow a grow out project for um, kind of making making a, a double rainbow um, out of these Miami Vice zoanthids. Um, so it's sort of it's a it's an artistic it's an artistic project um, that we'll be we'll be filming sometime soon. But yeah, the we call them the the, the Vice zoanthids not only because the Miami Vice coloration of, of the pink and the blue. But also because they grow so tight together, they're sort of like they're tight like vices. So like, oh. they, they make a really nice uh, carpet, um, and they like they like yeah, SPS I'm, conditions. I'm looking at that. I'm noticing that. I never really noticed that before. I mean, and it is true. Different species of zoanthids seem to do different, mm -hmm. you know, different things. But I'm looking at these, and it, it's like they, it's almost like a, uh, it's like a, I mean, as 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 dumb as it sounds, it's it's on. They look almost like a. A can or true, you know they, they mm -hmm. jam in there so tightly, so that, tightly that 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 makes a really has a really beautiful effect. In it terms really of does. Where it grows over, you got the uh, eight line eight line ras. He's been with us for five or six years. Um, I wish he would eat uh, some more of these flatworms, <laughs> but uh, but he's he's a, he's a cool fish. Um, yeah, I've had a proliferation of flatworms, and I don't know how and where. They were just red flatworms. I'm not, I'm not concerned about them. But my six line ras, six line rasses have not been doing, uh, not been doing, not his been job. doing their job because they, <laughs> they used to be. That was what I simply used for, um, for flatworm, the red flatworm control. But um, I'm not too worried about them. Very cool. Well, yeah. this is. Uh, I mean, you got some beautiful stuff in here, and everything looks. Like it's doing really well. I'm glad it you is. like the uh, like the radions. It's the radions have been a, a huge made a world of difference in the coral growth. I mean, you can take a look at, at some of these these acros and see um, pretty much you know, that red planet is all that's all new growth within the last couple months. Um, just exploded with growth. All these all these tips on the on the acros have all just sort of been popping. Popping out ever since um, we used, started to use the radions in the in the MP40s. Very cool. Yeah. Awesome. Well, uh, thank you so much for your time, and yeah. really appreciate the tour and, and all this cool stuff going on here. It's, I'm glad uh, that you were able to actually come and come and visit. You know, we get to we get to to Skype back and forth, but it makes a a big difference to actually now, come now do you it. do you entertain visits from the public or um, do you ever have an open house or anything along those we've, lines we've we get hit up uh, enough these days to come and visit we actually put a we had to put a um a tour on our website so um if you come to miami for 50 bucks you and a you and a friend uh, can come and i'll i'll give you i'll give you the personalized uh core morphologic tour so, um, so not really open to the public, but um, you know, you got to reach out, and uh, I'm always happy to uh, to show people what we're up to. Very cool, and yeah. um, and that is always changing, which is the other really cool thing about. We are always working on lots of lots of different projects um, locally with the with the local corals that we have living here in Miami, but also working with school kids and you know working on film projects art projects um, you know really anything anything that we any opportunity that we can introduce corals into into an area that they have not been introduced to that's uh, we're always always looking for things to uh, to bring the corals along very cool